Great job today, worship team. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. As I look out there at you guys, some of you kind of look like you just woke up. Some of you look like me. You know what? You thought seriously about not being here today. Probably because you're tired and you're worn out, so hopefully the sermon will help with that this morning. Especially, especially for those of you who are working yourself to death trying to earn God's approval. Hopefully this message will help with that. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And this morning we'll be looking at verses 12 through 18. Can I get everyone to please stand? Beginning in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just give you glory this morning. We praise you. There is no God like our God. There is no spirit like our spirit. Father God, there is no Savior like our Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And so, Father God, we just ask that you would be pleased. Father God, we also ask that you would be present. That, Father, that you would speak to every one of us. That you would take this message and just speak directly to our hearts, directly to the situations that we're facing today to help us to find that rest that seems to be so elusive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, in the Old Testament, God created a day of rest so that his people would not get worn out. It was called the Sabbath. It was a Sabbath rest. And I think all of us know this. We know that rest is important. It rejuvenates us. It recharges our batteries. Without it, we kind of look like the Grinch or like Ebenezer Scrooge. Or we look like those people in the Snickers commercials, you know what I'm talking about? When they say you're not yourself when you're hungry. Well, let me tell you something. You're not yourself when you're tired as well. You can be very grumpy. Kind of like this one husband was, who was just impossible to please, especially around breakfast time. His wife would make him scrambled eggs and he would complain because they weren't poached. She would make poached eggs and he would complain because they weren't scrambled. And so she thought she got this idea. She thought for sure that this would, would satisfy her husband. This would please him. And so she scrambled one egg and poached the other. And she brought him to him with great anticipation. But then he kind of snorted at her. And he says, woman, can't you do anything right? You scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> now I know what some of you ladies are thinking. You think he should have been making his own eggs in the first place, right? You know what, when we get tired, we become like that. We become grumpy, so we need to have rest. Now, some people live to work, and other people work to live. And guys, if we're not careful, our jobs can be, become more important than our wives and kids. We have to be careful of that. See, a lot of guys have found themselves in divorce court, not because they did not provide financially for their family, but because they did not provide emotionally for their family. I mean, they, they went out and bought the best of everything. They got them the best house on the block to only watch it become an empty house because they were never there to help them. So guys, don't live to work. Work to live. You see, when you work to live, you work to bring joy to your family. You work to provide for your family so you can enjoy time with your family. 
When you work to live, your job doesn't define who you are as a man. What defines who you are as a man is your relationship with your God, your relationship with your wife, and your relationship with your kids. Besides, Jesus makes it clear that if you fail to provide for your family, that you are a complete failure in life. He says that in 1 Timothy 5.8. He says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, <clears throat> he has denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. He says he's worse than an unbeliever, a complete failure. So let me say it one more time, guys. Don't live to work. Work to live. See, work is a means to an end. It is not the end itself. On the other hand, some people live to rest. They don't live to work or work to live. They live to rest. For them, work is like a, a dirty word. I mean, I think it really is worse. In fact, they know it's worse to live to, to rest than it is to live to work. Because at least when you're living to work, you're bringing some benefit to your family. Amen? Amen. You're bringing some benefit. And, and you're, you're at least trying. But the best case scenario is what? It is to work to live, to be a man. That's one of the reasons I'm so excited, because we've got this new series coming up about authentic manhood, called 33, the series Authentic Manhood. It's going to start a week from Thursday on the 13th at 7 o'clock. And once again, I want to invite every one of you guys to come and be a part of this. Just remember, it's only six weeks. And in this series, a really cool part is it reminds us that God did not put us on this planet to be boys. He did not put you on this planet to be a man-child. No, God put us on this planet to be real men. Now, one of the traits of a boy is that, that a boy is a childish consumer. He consumes hours of TV, hours of video games, hours and hours of recreation. The child consumer lives to rest. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't rest. I already told you guys that we need recreation, but we need to make sure that there is a balance between work and recreation. The problem is that the childish consumer lives to rest. And once again, the problem is the family is neglected, and what's as bad as that is that a life is wasted. God did not put us on this planet to be boys. He did not put us on this planet to be a, a child consumer. See, for a man-child, the sad thing is even church is work. Even church. And like I said, one thing a man-child doesn't like is, is work. And so church is work. Going to church is work. Getting up in the morning to go, that's work. Talking to people at church, that's work. Singing the songs and listening to the sermon, that's work. And like I said, if there's one thing that a childish consumer does not like, there's one thing that a man-child doesn't like, it's work. And so church is work. It's kind of like the story of this wife who wakes her husband up for church one Sunday morning. And he retorts, I'm not going. And so his wife says, well, why not? He says, I'll tell you why. He says, because those people at church, they're all judgmental. They're mean. They don't like me. And you know what? I don't like them either. The wife says, well, you still have to go to church. And the man says, well, give me one reason, just one reason why I should go to church. And the wife says, well, because you're the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> that shows you that a man-child can come from any area of life. And I better not see any fingers pointing at you. <laughs> Men, God did not create us to live the rest. He put us on this planet, as that second video is going to show us, to create and to cultivate. And so how do we know that God put us on this planet to create and cultivate? We know it because we are created in the image of God our Father. And that's what He did. In Genesis 1.27 it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, God created the earth of formless and void, and then he began cultivating it. He cultivated it with streams of water that would water the plants that he had planted. 
And so He created and cultivated. And so if we're going to be like God, the, the one that we are created in the image of, then we've got to cultivate our kids. We've got to cultivate, cultivate our family. We've got to cultivate everything that God has given us responsibility over. Now that we've established that there needs to be a balance between work and rest, I want to move on and I want to talk about how we are supposed to work and rest, or better yet, how we are to work for rest. And this is really important. This is for men and women here. This is for everyone. It's really important that we learn how to do this. Because if we don't get this right, we will be frustrated in life. If we don't get this right, we will be very, very unproductive in life. We might get a lot done, but when it's all said and done, what we accomplish will be insignificant compared to what we could have accomplished. And this is especially true as we start talking about having a spiritual impact in this world, as we talk about leaving a spiritual footprint behind. How many of you want to make a difference in future generations? How many of you want to live a life that when you look back at it, when it's over with, you realize that you have left a spiritual footprint that can be seen by those that you've influenced in your life, those that you've influenced for Christ, those that you've helped lead to Christ, those that you've helped grow into Christ. I think all of us should have that desire to want to leave behind some kind of spiritual footprint. You know, one of the great paradoxes in the Bible is found in Hebrews 4.11 where it says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Notice what it says. It says to make every effort. What's effort? It's work. And so we need to work to enter God's rest. And so that's the paradox. Work equals rest. Rest doesn't equal rest. Work equals rest. But here's the key thing. It's probably not the kind of rest that you're thinking about. Just as in verses 12 and 13, it's not talking about us working for our salvation or earning our salvation when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What it's talking about when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it's not talking about trying to earn it. It's talking about thinking about it in your mind. Working it out. Realizing where you'd be right now if God had not come into your life. Fear and trembling as you think about where you would be when you die if Jesus had not died on the cross for you. Now some of you, you've had some close encounters in life. Some of you had some near misses. Some of you had some point where maybe you were a second late entering an intersection. And if you'd been one second faster, you would have gotten T-boned. All of you have something in your life, you go, man, I'm so glad that didn't happen. I think when I was like six years old, I almost drowned. I mean, I was close. My mom just barely saw, my sister actually saw this little patch of what she thought was grass underneath the water. And she said, mom, look at the grass. If my sister had never seen my hair floating under the water, I would not be here today. I would be another statistic. And I could look back at that and go, wow. I would have never been able to be a pastor. I would have never been able to be a, a husband and a father. And so that's what it's talking about, is work it out in your mind. Think about where you would be right now. So it's not about you earning something. It's about you uh, understanding what God has done for you. In the same way, if we try to work for rest, it isn't like we're working to earn it. In fact, if you look in this verse, you're going to notice it says this. It says, for it is God who, work, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Twice it tells us that we are not the one really doing the work, that God is the one doing the work through us. The biggest thing here is the work we do is we yield and we make God the Lord of our life. And so the work is yielding to God. And the beautiful thing is, when we learn to yield to God the way we should, then we get a rest like we've never experienced in our life. And so the working that we do as we work for rest is yielding to God. Now I really wish I could tell you that it's a once and done. That once you yield your life to God, you're never going to have to do it again. 
But the truth is, it's an ongoing process. It's a daily decision where you, where you have to make the decision to either live life under your own strength and do it your own way, or to live under God's strength and watch how He will work through you. Now, as I talk about rest, I want to make sure you understand that rest doesn't mean sitting around doing nothing all day. I mean, that, that is laziness. It's kind of like the cat, you know, the fat cat. I think all of us have a cat. Some of us do anyway. That's a fat cat. About the only time you see the cat move is to go to the food bowl. That's laziness. That's not what we want to look like. Let me just say this. If you're capable of working, you need to work. Not everyone's capable, but if you're capable of working, you need to work. And that's what Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. He says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now the context of that, you have to understand, is that in Thessalonica, there was few people there that believed the second coming was imminent. They believed that it was imminent. And so they thought, well, hey, if Jesus is coming back, why work? Why make an investment when it isn't going to mean anything? Because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Why should I work today? And the sad part is they were relying on the resources of other people who were doing what? Working. And so that's why he said these people weren't laid off. These people weren't disabled. These were able-bodied people who could work. Notice the wording. The one who is unwilling. It doesn't say unable. It says unwilling. And so what it's trying to say is just um, don't confuse laziness or inactivity with God's rest. So we're talking about laziness. There's a story of a man who went to his doctor. And he said, Doc, I've got this problem. I can't do all the stuff around the house that I used to do. And, and so the doctor did an examination of him. And when he was done, the man said, okay, Doc, give it to me straight. Give it to me in plain English. The doctor said, okay, in plain English, you're just lazy. The man said, okay, can you give me a medical term so I can tell my wife? I mean, there's a lot of us husbands that might fall in that category. Now, I really believe the key, the success to work and rest is abiding in Christ. I really believe that's the key. In John 15, verses 4 through 5, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so, in, in, in these verses, Jesus is pointing out two very important realities. The first reality is that if you're going to do anything of eternal significance in this life, you have to abide in Christ. The second reality that he's pointing out here is that when you abide in Christ, when Christ abides in you, that you won't just bear some fruit, you'll bear much fruit. Much fruit. And I think Paul understood that. That's why he wrote in 2 Corinthians 12.10, For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What Paul is saying is when you give up thinking that, that in your own power that you can accomplish anything great for God and you start living like it all depends on God because it does, then God will be able to work through you. Then you will produce much fruit in your life. Now, the reason Paul knew this was true is because God told him so. Back in the previous verse, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God says to Paul, For my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. In other words, my power is perfected in your weakness when you understand who you are and what your limitations are compared to what I can do. I mean, you're, you're limited in what you can do, but you know what? If I enter your life, if I get into the equation, there's no end to what you can do. No end at all. And so Paul understood that. Now here's the really cool part, is when we abide in Christ, 
We get more done and it takes less out of us. Isn't that cool? Get more done and it takes less out of us. Let me try to explain it this way. Let's suppose I ask John Arnold to dig a hole that was six feet wide, six feet long, and six feet deep, and I handed him a shovel. I mean, John would be exhausted. It would take him hours and hours, and he would be exhausted. He'd probably hate me when he was done. But on the other hand, let's suppose that I asked John to dig a hole that was six feet wide by six feet long by six feet deep, and I gave him a back hole. I mean, that would be easy, wouldn't it? I mean, I've run a backhoe before. I know how to run a backhoe. You drop the bucket, you set the brake, you hit that little handle on the seat, you spin around, you're facing the other direction, you drop the right leg, you drop the left leg, you take the throttle and you, you throttle up a little bit so that when you move the arm and the bucket, everything moves smoothly, and you've got these little levers. And you just lose these little levers and that backhoe does all the work for you. And so you have a choice this morning. A shovel or a backhoe. Your strength or God's strength working in you. You know, some of you are losing every single day, not because you can't win, but because you're using a shovel instead of a backhoe. And so my suggestion to you this morning is put down the shovel, get in the backhoe, and watch what God will do through you and for you. Amen? Amen. Now, earlier I talked about rest. Not laziness, but rest. So I want to hit this one more time. As Christians, we are called to work for rest. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Let us work to enter that rest. Let's plug into God. Let's abide in Christ. So all those stressors, all those weights that we are under, that God can lift them up and so that we can have peace in our lives. One verse earlier it says, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works. Now what does that mean? It doesn't mean you quit working. We've already established that. It means you quit trying to do it on your own. It means you quit trying to carry the load of the world on your shoulders and you say, okay God, I'm going to abide in you. I'm going to do my part, but I know I am absolutely powerless if you're not involved. I will never accomplish anything of any eternal significance, God, if you're not there with me, if I'm not abiding in you and you're not abiding in me. And here's the most important part of God working in us and for us, and that is that all the work of salvation is done. Jesus has already done all the work of salvation on the cross, there is nothing left to do. There is nothing that's left undone. And the most important thing you need to understand is that there is nothing you can add to the cross and there's nothing that your sin can do to take away. See, we usually try to make up one of two ways. We either try to say, okay, God, you've gotten this far, I'll finish it. I'll work the rest of the way and make up. And then the other side is we have sins and we think, well, God, you saved me. But I blew it, so now I've got to work three times as hard to make it up to you. It's all done. When Jesus was on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. And here, here's the really cool part about that. That means when you go to bed at night, it means you can lay your head on the pillow, knowing three things. Knowing that God is on his throne, knowing that you are on his mind and that you are under his protection. Amen. Let me tell you, when you know those three things, when you lay your head on the pillow at night and you know that God is on his throne, that you are on his mind and that you are under his protection, you know what happens? You get to sleep like a baby. Why? Because you're resting in Jesus. Amen. Amen.